Hi, I'm Andy McNeil. I'm the Director of Research here at the ACFE, and I'm really excited today to be joined by Jeremy Clopton. Jeremy is the owner of What's Your SQ, and he's an ACFE faculty member. He's also kind of my go-to guru in the data <laughs> analytics and emerging technologies realm. So um, I'm hoping we'll have a really interesting conversation here for you all to enjoy today. Specifically, we're talking about leveraging emerging technology and advanced analytics as part of fraud examinations. And we're talking about that because Jeremy is doing a pre-conference session at our Global Fraud Conference this summer um, on that exact topic. And so we thought it would be really fun and interesting to explore a few of those topics today with you all. Hi, Jeremy. Thanks for coming. Andy, good to be here. Um, so to sort of set the stage for this conversation, I had a question for you. It's actually something that I personally realized that I wanted some clarification on. And that's when we talk about artificial intelligence and we mm -hmm. talk about machine learning, are those the same thing? Are they different? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, typically, artificial intelligence is a broader term uh, than machine learning. So artificial intelligence is generally where you have a system, typically a computer in the current, current sense. Uh, that is able to do the functions and do the things that a person could do. So it's intelligence like a human might have, but it's artificial. Uh, machine learning is technically speaking a subset of that. Uh, I've heard some that have referred to it as the current state of artificial intelligence because machine learning is really the part that is, uh, you know, it's really mainstream right now. It's where a lot of the, the developments are happening. Right. So you see it as used interchangeably in some spaces because it is a subset. So are they the exact same thing? No. Uh, are they definitely related? Yes. So okay. it's machine learning is more narrowly focused. Artificial intelligence is much broader. It can be, you know, what you see with machine learning. It can be more general AI. It can be a number of different things that go beyond machine learning. But machine learning is really <clears throat> feeding into that artificial It's feeding into it, okay. yeah. Okay. It's really helping the development of artificial intelligence. It's where you're seeing it applied in more industries now, especially in fraud examinations, is machine learning some of the some of the best use cases. So you're, you're seeing it used a lot okay. with AI. That that helps me a lot. Understand? <laughs> I've, I'm pretty sure I've used some of that incorrectly. So I will do better now. Um, but so along those lines, though, now that we have that context, can you give us some examples of how you know these tools are being used in the anti-fraud space? Yeah. So machine learning is probably the one of the better examples as to how it's being used. And probably the way that it's most commonly being used right now is from supervised machine learning. So when you get to machine learning, there's typically two different types. You've got supervised machine learning and unsupervised machine learning. And the supervised machine learning is where you have the examiner working with the machine and helping it learn. So okay. machine learning is essentially what it sounds like. It is the machine learning how to do something or learning about a data set. There are two different ways that it can learn. It can be taught by an individual or it can be taught by itself. It can be self-learning. Now, there's data scientists that are watching this. They're like, well, that's a complete oversimplification <laughs> of the technology. <laughs> yes, it is. But let's keep it simple. That's, sure. that's what's happening. Sure. So supervised machine learning, you see it in, say, predictive coding. So you've got uh, a 500,000 email set that you need to get through, a document set that you need to get through. You can do just a simple predictive model that says, hey, I'm going to look at uh, a couple thousand of these, and I'm going to say, here's what's relevant and here's what's not relevant. I'm going to feed it back in, and then it's going to apply to the entire data set, and you just use what that model is. That's not really machine learning, okay. right? You just said, here's the model. Go with it. Go find me more of these. Go find right. me more of this. Okay. If you get into the supervised machine learning space, it's more of an interaction with the machine and the oh, wow. examiner. Okay. So you can say, here's the model, maybe here's some training sets, here's where we know that we have fraud, here's uh, you know, companies that didn't have fraud, uh, to the extent we know about it, and the machine can learn from that. And it may say, okay, here examiner, here is a sample of, or here's a, a set of 5,000 emails out of this half million set. These I believe are relevant based on what you've provided me as parameters. What you've taught me so far, these should be relevant. The examiner can then go through, review those, and say, yes, this is relevant, no, this is not relevant, yes, no, yes, no, yes, okay. no. Provide that feedback. It goes back into, the, back into the model. The model learns from that, taking everything it knew before, plus the feedback that it now has, and then it pulls a better sample, and it gets 
it gets better as it goes. So it's fine tuning the model based exactly. on the human interaction. Exactly. Okay. So that's the supervised machine learning. You are supervising the machine as it learns, which makes sense. That can, you know, at least in my experience, I've seen that that can reduce, you know, how many documents you have to review, especially from an email set from you sure. know, 80 to 90%, Absolutely. which if anybody's ever had to go through document review and reviewing emails, half a million is way too many. Right. I mean, 500 for that matter. You're probably eyes are glossing over and you're thinking, I can't go any further. Right. It helps with effectiveness and efficiency. So the flip side of that is unsupervised machine learning, where the model itself is using the data that it's presented with and saying, all right, I am going to evaluate the data set and I'm going to learn from it as it changes. You typically see that more with anomaly detection or clustering, right? So here's the data set and it's going to tell you here are some of the unusual items. Okay. Um, and from there you can then research and determine why is it unusual? Yes, it's an anomaly. No, it doesn't mean it's fraud. I've right. yet to find the find fraud button. I joke. <laughs> <laughs> I joke with a lot of people. I wish I could invent it because right. that would well, make, Well, then you know, we'd all be out of jobs, right? That's the well, problem. Well, exactly, right? There, but there is no fine fraud button. Exactly. Technology isn't going to completely replace the examiner. Even in unsupervised, all it's going to do is tell you, here are the anomalies. Here's what's unusual and here's what you have to do. You need to go look at this. Right. What it does is it helps you figure out, okay, where are the anomalies that I didn't look? So, you know, to me, I really like the fact that there's both of those out there. Um, the, the supervised is, say you have a tip come in, right? I, I know what type of fraud I'm looking for. I know what this fraud has looked like in the past. So now I can go and look, you know, build a model that will look for more like that. Okay. And I can teach it as it goes to tailor it to this company or this situation. The unsupervised is then, okay, here's the data set, analyze it, Tell me everything unusual that you find as a machine, and then I can go back and say, okay, did I miss something? Because there's a good chance that we may have. There may be something else unusual that wasn't brought to our attention. Right. The unsupervised learning can help us there. So there's a couple different ways that it can be used. That's really interesting. So the idea of both using what you know about fraud for mm -hmm. the supervised, and then it sounds like for the unsupervised, it's really what don't we know about fraud? What types yeah. of fraud maybe did we not anticipate or what red flags were we unaware of is that yeah exactly the, i mean with really the, interesting yeah with the supervised you've got to help build the model you've okay. got to help say all right here's here's a known you have to train it right right and on the unsupervised you're not you're simply going in and saying all right what's unusual in here right what looks different exactly interesting. Um, so it helps so you mentioned um specifically email data sets mm -hmm. Is that where you see this being the most useful right now, or is this applicable to other types of data as well? It's applicable across the board. I mean, even from structured data. I mean, take purchasing card transactions. Um, I'm actually going to use, um, I have a demo that I'm going to do at the, at the pre-conference session uh, that's built on purchasing card data to say, okay, here is, here's all the transactions. Here are all the transactions from a given time period. And there's an unsupervised model uh, that will analyze it and then essentially cluster it and say, okay, here's a group that's similar over here. Here's a group that's similar here. Here's a really small group of outliers here. Here's kind of the general populace. Okay. So you can use it on transactional data as well, which to me is really nice from a proactive standpoint, right? We're not yeah, necessarily absolutely. doing a fraud exam. Instead, we're saying, all right, we want to identify the unusual when the unusual pops up, not once we already know that it's this huge, big fraud and it's blatantly obvious and a rules-based system will find it, right? It's, it's helping us to do that. On the flip side, so take, take away the transactions, I think the unstructured side and email is one of my personal favorites. Um, you and I have talked about Absolutely. that numerous times. <laughs> Anytime you can get communications data, uh, it always blows my mind what people will talk about, whether it's an email, instant <laughs> messages, social media, wherever it is that they are communicating. But specifically with email, you can get so much information. Right. Um, and it's not just keywords. It's it's sentiment. It's emotion. It's networks. It's concept maps. It's anything and everything about what they're communicating about, who they're communicating about, why they're communicating about it. I mean, one of the big challenges that we have as examiners is not really a – it is a challenge and it's not, right? We can't have an opinion on intent. All right, That's right. for the judge or the jury to decide. Right. We don't opine on intent. But if somebody has an email that says, I really look forward to committing this fraud with you, 
We don't necessarily have to have that opinion. We can use that evidence exactly. to help our case. There's a lot of value there. Um, and learning what is a normal communication pattern versus a not normal or an unusual or an anomalous communication pattern. Or even pattern. a change in communication change patterns. Change in communication Absolutely. pattern. Exactly. Because, and you'll see that from time to time. You know, people will change how they communicate. Let's say, um, you know, an example from, uh, you know, when I was, uh, my prior company was an organization announced, we're going to have, we're going to conduct an examination. Right, we are going to do a fraud investigation, and you then looked at how are people communicating before that announcement oh, wow. and after that announcement. And when you start to see changes in nervousness, the evasiveness, that can indicate. Well, why did this person change? Now, I'm I'm convinced human nature is if somebody makes an announcement at your company that there's going to be an investigation, we're all going to get say, nervous. Most people are probably going to start yeah. watching what they say a little bit more closely. Exactly. Sure. I'm not going to email and say, do you think Andy committed the $753,000 <laughs> fraud using this vendor over exactly. here? Right? <laughs> We're going to be a bit uneasy. But you're going to yeah. normalize. Absolutely. Right after a few days, you kind of go back to the status quo. Yes, there's an investigation. No, we're not freaking out about it. It's the people that don't go back. Right? They have a completely new pattern of activity now we need to figure out really why did that change occur? Again, does it mean there's fraud? No, they could just be paranoid as I'll get out, right? Or hiding something fine. completely unrelated to the fraud exactly. or worried they're going to lose their job for a different reason. For a but, different reason. But that helps you at least home in on those areas of potential um, red flags yes. for watching. Exactly. We're looking for changes in patterns. Um, to me, it's trend analysis is not just numbers. Right, you can trend emotion over time. You can trend a concept map over time. I don't necessarily care what the concept map for, let's say, the director of purchasing. It's one of my favorite applications because corruption to me is one of the hardest, hardest frauds to find. Right, uh, it's not off book. I've yet to see anybody recorded as a kickback expense or a corruption expense <laughs> in the books. Right, it's not there. Um, but you have somebody that has influence. And where do you see influence in an organization? You see it in communication patterns. You see it in instant messages. From there, you can start to take that and see, do you have a change in who they're communicating with? And does that then tie back to the structured data, right? Let's, I, I like to call it giving, giving the transactions personality right. and giving the communications value. Interesting. It's the intersection of the unstructured and the structured you can't just do that in a rules-based environment. Right. You have to have something more. To me, that's where machine learning and artificial intelligence comes in. It helps us you know, identify what are those changes, what are those anomalies, how is it evolving over time. Okay. Um, so with that in mind, I know for a lot of organizations, the idea of implementing these concepts can be daunting, and primarily due to cost or maybe even just a lack of truly understanding where to start. So yeah. where is a good place for organizations to start when they're looking at adding artificial intelligence or machine learning into their anti-fraud programs? It, it can be a challenge. It's not, there are some off-the-shelf solutions. Um, that's typically where the cost is right. involved, right? <laughs> I mean, if you, if you want the off-the-shelf easiest solution, you have to pay for that. Uh, at the same time, there are a lot of solutions that are out there uh, that are that are cost effective. So you can have, um, you know, Python, for instance, you know, programming languages. Python are some of those that are fairly standard out there. They interface with a lot of the structured analytics platforms. They integrate, and those are great ways uh, to use artificial intelligence and machine learning. I mean, there are there are sites out there where you can do you know online courses and certifications right. in Python for machine learning. And Python is is that ShareWorks? Python's free? open source, it's yeah. Open source. So, you know, there are things you can pay for, uh, as right. with everything. But, I mean, really at its core, it's an open source program. Uh, the packages that are used for machine learning, natural language processing, you know, those are open source as well. There are ways to do it without the cost of buying software. With that, though, you have the risk of do you know how to program exactly. machine learning models effectively? <laughs> um there are certain, you know, there are some uh, software solutions out there that I've seen that have free versions that you can use, trial periods, uh, only up to so much data. You know, there are right. different ways to do that. But to me, I think the more important thing that organizations really have to think about as it comes to are you going to use machine learning and artificial intelligence 
you know, for fraud exams or fraud prevention doesn't make sense. Um, you know, there are there are ways to use it internally for prevention that you can't just set up overnight. You know, right. it's going to take time. It's going to take data access. It's going to take data security. It's going to have to take a full fraud risk assessment. Hopefully, they've already done that. But there are so many other things that you have to think about to really, you know, make integrate this into the in, into the culture of the organization and use it as a preventative tool. To me, you have to you have to step back and say, all right, we've done our fraud risk assessment. Does it make sense in the course of what we're doing? I mean, don't get me wrong. I'd love to use artificial intelligence and machine learning for a lot of things. <laughs> right. Does it pass the cost benefit analysis? No. I mean, it doesn't make sense to do that. Right. So, or at least at this point for exactly. a lot of organizations. Sure. And the costs are coming down. That's one of the great things about it. Um, you know, there are a lot of a lot of sites that you can go out and do some rudimentary, some basic sentiment analysis, concept mapping, network relationship maps for no cost. Right. Um, some that you can do it for a very small incremental cost. The technology is getting better. The processing, you know, power it's getting better. The technology is no longer the true hurdle. I don't think. Okay. I think one of the bigger hurdles is figuring out where it fits and doesn't make sense, and not doing it for the sake of using the new shiny objects, right. and the well, new shiny technology. And do you think that there's any cultural considerations? I think you mentioned something along those lines. If an organization is going to go down this path and start looking into implementing these types of tools. Are there cultural considerations that need to be weighed into the equation, or is it something that's so behind the scenes you don't think it really affects that angle uh, too much? It is behind the scenes, but at the same time, that's cultural as well, because that's the reason most companies won't do it. I'm convinced, and from everybody that I've talked to, you know, I'll ask the question, do you have a policy that says you can use your company's email right. proactively? And they'll say yes. And I'll say, do you do it? I'm like, no, that's too big brother. Okay, but you'll do it as soon as you think somebody exactly, has done something yeah. wrong. There is a cultural aspect of it. Um, you, you have to be comfortable using data proactively. You have to be comfortable using the most valuable, which is sometimes the most personal data, proactively. Uh, so there's a cultural aspect there. The, the management is willing to do it. The leadership's on board with it. Along with that, I mean, just not, not even just cultural, but you've got to consider legal aspects of Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Um, you know, obviously for those that are in the international space, in the EU especially, GDPR, but it, GDPR is more than just... Yes. EU, um, you have to consider that. You have to consider the ethical side of things. There are a lot of considerations to using some of this data and using this technology. And it's not just it's not just the fact that you're using email, but I mean, it's also does it make sense with the way that you approach things? Okay. Um, you have to have an organization that's going to be willing to follow up right. because if you do it right, you can have this running all the time, right? Machine learning isn't something you're just going to do once a year. Right, like, you're going to push the button and say, okay, go learn right, right now, machine. Right? Exactly. It's, you want it to be ongoing. You want the learning to be consistent. It, it needs to be a continuous, a continuous type of approach. So you have to have a culture that's going to say, we're willing to do that. And I think that a lot of organizations, it scares them a little bit. Sure. Um, you know, we're going to have more follow-up. It's going to take more time. Maybe. But if it's a well-trained model and you're putting in the effort to set it up appropriately on the front end, it's going to be more effective. You'll eventually get to efficiency. I think that scares a lot of people <laughs> too, right? It's new technology. We're going to be more efficient and we're going to be more effective. Right. I think we focus too much on efficiency. Um, I think we need to focus more on effectiveness first. The efficiency okay. will come with technology. Uh, but there is a cultural aspect to that. It's, mm -hmm. it's We want to be more efficient, not more Absolutely. effective necessarily. Yeah. It's that investing in the, in the initial pass to make sure that you are being effective so that over time it becomes more efficient as it, as it grows. It is. And, you know, you mentioned the behind the scenes part of the cultural aspect of it. To me, if you're going to use machine learning and you're going to use artificial intelligence, if, even if it's broader than machine learning, and you're going to use that for fraud prevention and detection in your organization, don't make it behind the scenes. Right. I mean, you need to have that. You need to be talking about it. You need to let people know. You need to let them know the sophistication level of the technology, uh, even if it's not your technology specifically, but the sophistication level that's possible with your right. technology, because that's also going to help that perception of detection. Exactly. I think that's probably overlooked a little bit with technology. You know, oh, well, we don't want people to know we're looking for fraud. Oh, we don't want to know, let people know how sophisticated the tools are. Why not? Well, I think you need to tell them. I, I agree completely. That was one of the findings in our most recent report to the nations was 
that proactive data monitoring and analysis, it it ranks right up there as one of the most effective um, ways for organizations to mitigate their fraud losses and catch fraud sooner. So, yeah. you know, the data backs you up. It, it does. <laughs> I was glad when uh, when that was added to the report yeah. to the nations a few years ago because it's interesting that it's it is the most. If you look at Median loss and median duration combined, if I recall correctly, it ranks highest it collectively as most effective. It does. But if you look at the most commonly cited anti-fraud controls, I want to say this year it was like 37%, it's less than right 40. The, yeah. It's one of the lower as uh, lower ranked as most cited. So it's the most effective, but not a whole lot, you know, maybe a third to 40% of organizations right. were using it, which is interesting because if you look at some of the most often, you know, most cited anti-fraud controls, they're sometimes the least It's the effective. flip side, right? So, it's yeah, interesting. It doesn't, so we doesn't some, exactly match. Some opportunity there, but I do think we're seeing some shift, and I think that's why yes. there's interest in the topics we're, we're discussing today as well. So, um, you know, we talked about the idea of um, using some of the free tools that are out there mm -hmm. and knowing that you need to have a certain skill set on staff. Are there any other tips you can give organizations that are really trying to vet that cost benefit at this point is there anything that they should be keeping in mind as they look at how much data are they collecting mm -hmm. or you know what skill sets do they already have on staff is this something that internal audit could do mm -hmm. where, where would you advise people to start with that internal conversation yeah i think the internal conversation one thing that you want to do is i would actually argue that you want to reach outside of internal audit and compliance there's probably a part of your organization that's done it before. It's the marketing department. Oh, that's interesting. Because the technology is probably already in place on the marketing side of most organizations. Okay. They're using advanced analytics. They're using AI. They're using machine learning. It is probably, from a technology standpoint, the place that it's been used the longest. Internal audit and compliance and fraud risk, we're trying to catch up with the marketing side. And... That's not a bad thing necessarily. To me, what I like about that is we have somebody in our organization now that's already done this. So if we're trying to figure out how to weigh the cost benefit, we need to look outside of our team. One of the best ways to use this technology is to do it collaboratively. You know, How can we talk with other aspects of the organization, other departments that have already done it? I would also focus on what are your biggest risks? Right. And can you make a difference with the biggest risks? Right. It gets back to... You go to the fraud risk assessment, right? You may have 50 to 100 items that you need to get through on that fraud risk assessment in the next year that are high risk. you got a couple different ways that you can do this. I would encourage you to look at maybe your top three and say, can machine learning or can even broader AI, can it help me more effectively control my top three risks? If so, that is probably a great place for it. The other side of that is if you look at, say, your bottom 20, and is there something that I can put in place that where I could automated, you know, in an automated fashion, address a large amount, a large volume of my risks with one system? That's probably the direction, you know, that I would encourage people to look. It isn't can I use AI broadly? You can. It's like saying can I use analytics broadly? You can. The question isn't, what can I do with my data? It's not, what can I do with technology? It's, what's the most important risk that I need to address? And is right. there a way that this helps me address that risk better? Because if the answer is no, even if you can pass the cost-benefit analysis, if you're not getting more effective, what's the point? Right. That's a good point. You know, I, I always try to focus it back on that, right? What is, what's relevant for my situation? Could I use technology to do something that's, cooler and neater and fancier with more bells and whistles? Well, of course you can. But if it's not relevant to what you're trying to accomplish, it's probably not the right way to go. And the same thing in trying to figure out, you know, what aspect of the data set do I want to use in artificial intelligence? Well, what's relevant to your risk? I mean, you've, every organization has enough data. That's probably not an issue. You have tons of it. It's figuring out what's relevant, what technology is relevant, and all that ties back to what is the risk you're trying to focus on? It has to drive the conversation. Right. It has to start with your risk, not with the technology. Well, and I find it interesting too because we've kind of come full circle where you talked about being able to use these to sort of identify mm -hmm. your risks, but then you really do need to make sure that when you go to employ them, you're using a risk-based approach. Exactly. So, um, so 
Last question I had for yeah. you. I wanted to know you personally. Where do you see this, this heading in the next few years? Where what's uh, what is the next gen of fraud examination? Yeah, I think the next gen is actually going to be a lot on the prevention side. I think you're going to have organizations that do deploy this technology. I think you're going to see it more widespread deployment internally on a preventative basis, where they are being proactive. They're addressing it in planning, right? You're doing right. it as part of the risk assessment as well as then addressing their biggest risks. From an examination standpoint, I think it's going to be on the most personal, communicative, unstructured data is where it's at. Because that data, by some estimations, it's what, 80, 90% of the data in an organization is not structured. It's outside the accounting system. Right. That's still largely untapped because it's hard to figure out how to how to analyze it for a lot of examiners. I think that's where the technology is going to be applied first is how can you use documents, how can you use email, how can you use instant messages, and all of the other non-structured data. Maybe it's something from you know the Internet of Things within an organization that and you know, GPS. I mean, there are so many different <laughs> unstructured data sets that are out there. I think the next gen is it's using artificial intelligence to leverage those data sources that are so valuable but are yet untapped. Okay. Well, if you want to hear more about Jeremy's take on next gen fraud examinations and how to leverage advanced analytics and in, in uh, emerging technology to help your fraud program, mm -hmm. join us for his pre-conference session on June 17th in Las Vegas. Um, and check out fraudconference.com for more information.